Hello everybody, this is John Buck, back with another Continuous Time Linear Systems video. In today's video, we're going to talk about the Laplace Transform. This Laplace Transform in Continuous Time plays the role very similar to what we saw with the Z Transform in Discrete Time Signal Processing last term. Uh, so, it generalizes the Fourier Transform to a broader class of signals. There are a lot of signals for whom the Fourier Transform does not converge, but the Laplace Transform does. And we'll see this allows us to analyze even more signals and more systems. Particularly important in continuous time is uh, analyze uh, sy systems that are not stable. The Laplace transform gives us the mathematical tools to think about what we might be able to do to make those systems stable in a way that we can't really do with the Fourier transform because we can't write the frequency response of a system if it's unstable because it doesn't have a, the, its impulse response will not have a Fourier transform. And we'll see as, as we go through this that there are a lot of overlap, a lot of similarities between the role the Z-transform played in discrete time and the kind of problems that let us solve and the similar problems and techniques we'll see in the continuous time uh, story using the Laplace transform. So I'm going to uh, stop the video for now, switch over to the whiteboard, and start explaining the Laplace transform for you. So the Laplace transform is defined as an integral that x of s equals the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of x of t e to the minus st dt. And so in form, it's similar again to a Fourier transform and that it's an integral transform from uh, one domain to the other. But in general here, instead of s being a, a real number, s is a complex number. We often write it as sigma plus j omega where sigma is the real part and j omega is the imaginary part. We can write a similar definition for what we call for talking about systems where the h of s which we call the system function equals the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of h of t the impulse response times e to the minus st dt. The, the, version for the relating the impulse response to the system function is particularly helpful because it actually brings us back to where we started the frequency story, which th this was lurking inside the eigenfunction property from the start. Remember that the eigenfunction property tells us what happens when we put any complex exponential into a system. Remember the eigenfunction property tells us that when the input to an LTI system is a complex exponential e to the st, the output of that system is the same complex exponential e to the st but scaled by some factor h of s where h of s is a constant with respect to t this gain but it is a function of s and again this is our system function so even though we didn't talk about it as a laplace transform back then when we derived the eigenfunction property just starting from the convolution integral right we had found even back at the start that the gain for a complex exponential followed this equation, which we now recognize is the Laplace transform equation from impulse response to h of s. Back then, we were just saying from the convolution integral, when we simplify things, this is how we find the gain from the impulse response. Coming back to the Laplace transform formula, it's also helpful to think for a minute. If I think about s as a complex and an argument, and I consider what happens if the real part sigma equals zero. What do I get when so when I evaluate the Laplace transform just on the j omega axis, the imaginary axis, pause for the video for a minute and think about well what happens to the Laplace transform. Right, now that we're back, we could say, well, if sigma equals zero, then this x of s, s is just when sigma is zero here, this would just be j omega. So I get x of j omega minus infinity to plus infinity, x integral of x of t e to the minus, well again, I'm going to replace this s by j omega, minus j omega t dt. Oh, that looks familiar. That's right, it's a Fourier transform. So again, this is how Laplace is like a more general version of Fourier, or you could say Fourier is a special case of Laplace. Right, but but if, if Laplace is a transform defined for the whole S-plane, 
when I look at just the imaginary axis, I get back to the Fourier transform. So I could simplify anything that has a Laplace transform to find its Fourier transform. There is also an inverse Laplace transform. Let me write that formula out. So, and, and this is the Laplace, inverse Laplace transform is what we use if we have h of s or x of s, and we're trying to find h of t or x of t. So we're trying to go backwards from a Laplace transform, which is a kind of frequency representation to the time domain. Again, we're pointing out that's why we write Laplace transforms as capital letters by default, because it's reminding us that this is a kind of frequency response or kind of frequency representation that we're working with frequency in some sense when we're working with Laplace. So let me write the now let me write the formula out for the Laplace transform inverse Laplace transform. So the inverse Laplace transform says x of t is one over two pi j the integral from sigma minus j infinity to sigma plus j infinity. So that's a line integral in the complex plane moving from mi the minus Im infinite imaginary axis all the way up offset from the axis by some amount sigma, x of s, e to the st ds, where sigma is some value in the region of convergence. And we'll, we'll see in the next videos what region of convergence means. I'm writing this out here for completeness sake. It's good to know that there is a well-defined inverse Laplace transform. It's also pretty clear even from the complicated formula here without too much trouble. If I re if I let s equal j omega and plug into this, I'll get the inverse Fourier transform. An important practical difference between inverse Laplace transforms and inverse Fourier transforms is that we frequently compute inverse Fourier transforms in this class. We will almost never compute the inverse Laplace transform in ECE 321. In fact, if you find yourself thinking you need to be computing an inverse Laplace transform in the class, I would strongly suggest you pause and think about if there's another way you could get the inverse transform using the tables and properties, because that's what we do almost all the time for the basic problems in this class. There are times in more advanced classes and more advanced problems, you will need to do this using things from complex analysis, but I can guarantee you now there will not be any homework or exam problem in this class where you must, the only way to find the inverse Laplace transform is using this integral. There is almost always an easier, simpler way to solve it. Okay, so that's the basic overview definition of Laplace transform, how it relates to the Fourier transform, how it relates to the eigenfunction property. I'm going to stop this video here, and in the next video I'm going to show you an example of computing the Laplace transform for a simple signal. Okay, I'll be, see you in just a minute.